Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining our webcast today, Harness the Power of Diversity to Nurture Successful Brands. My name is Ashley McManus. I am the Director of Marketing and Affectiva, and I will be your host today. With me, I have Affectiva co-founder and CEO, Rona al Kalyubi and Graham Page, Director of Offer and Innovation at Kantar Miller Brown. Before we begin, some housekeeping items. You can tweet during the event using the hashtag EmotionAI and tweet us at Affectiva. If you have any questions during the event, please write them in our Q&A section located in the bottom right of your screen or ask us in the chat box. Technical difficulties, please send us a message through WebEx or email us at events at affectiva.com and we will work our best to, to work with you to resolve the issue as we have quite a few registrations today. Also, please note that we are recording the webcast and we'll make the recording available to registrants before the end of the day. And now I will hand it off to Rana to begin our webcast. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We have uh, registrants from all around the world today. Uh, very exciting. As you may know, Affectiva spun out of MIT Media Lab a number of years ago. We are on a mission to humanize technology uh, by building artificial emotional intelligence, or emotion AI for short. Essentially, algorithms that can identify nuanced cognitive and emotional states from human facial expressions as well as voice. We've been very fortunate to have Hantar Millard Brown as our partner since 2011. Graham Page, who's with us here today, saw the need for our technology very early on, been an incredible champion uh, for productizing and operationalizing um, facial coding and emotion sensing algorithms um, in, the, in the Kantar Miller Brown solutions worldwide. So our combined solution is being <clears throat> used today over a third, um, by over a third of the global Fortune 100 companies and by thousands of brands around the world, day in, day out, to understand how people respond to advertising. And together we've tested over 20,000 ads around the world. Um, in the past year or so, we have seen a consistent trend emerge. Organizations and brands are a lot more focused and interested in diversity and inclusion than ever before. Um, at Affectiva, we are certainly seeing that in our field of um, artificial intelligence and in technology in, in general. And Graham is seeing that in the world of advertising as well. And so we thought together we could put together this webinar and kind of share our experience and, and our thoughts around this. Um, diversity is definitely the right thing to do ethically and socially. Um, but what we're positing today in this webinar is that if a company or a brand is able to harness diversity and inclusion in the right way, they are way more successful. Graham? Okay. Uh, and hi, everybody. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, and thanks, Rana, for the introduction. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess one of the, the questions you might be asking is, you know, why we even – you know, in 2018, talking about kind of diversity and uh, and you know, avoiding stereotyping and so on, because I guess most of us on on this call would uh, I doubt would think of ourselves as racist or sexist or homophobic, um, and yet we all kind of see examples of that that around us still, and, and increasingly I think we're all we're all sensitised to to examples of that. Um, and so I guess the, the, the point I'd start with is, is that the reason that happens is that, you know, unfortunately, you know, we all have our biases. Our biases are, are effectively wired and, and conditioned into our brains uh, through our experience. Um, and, and that means that we, we take to every, you know, every experience we have uh, a set of, of tacit or implicit assumptions which, um, you know, which shape and frame the decisions we make. So anybody who knows anything about, uh, you know, the, the brain and, and system one and so on knows that, you know, brains, our brains are, tend to be a bit lazy. We love a shortcut, and things like stereotypes are, are very much a shortcut that, that we, um, despite our best efforts, sometimes sometimes take. So that's why we see, uh, you know, some of the examples that we've seen, in, particularly in the marketing sphere, of, of, of campaigns going awry and, and, and inadvertently, perhaps, um, you know, portraying people in a in a less than progressive uh, fashion. Um, so, th so that's you know that's the reason you know they, we have we have built-in biases and and that has a, has an impact in what we see, and it's certainly true in the advertising industry that, that there is 
it seems still you know something of a challenge. Uh, the data on the screen that you're you're seeing at the moment comes from uh, a study done by Unilever with uh, Ubiquity, where they a couple of years ago reviewed um, the way different characters and, and the main protagonists and ads were were being portrayed. And for instance, they found found some pretty shocking things. For instance, uh, you know, eight, while 80% of ads were featuring women, about 60% of them were featuring uh, a female stereotype of some sort, and, and a lot of that was focused on stereotypical uh, appearance. Um, only 4% of ads uh, seemed to show women in aspirational roles. Only 3% of ads showed women as uh, notably intelligent, uh, and a tiny proportion, 0.3%, showed women uh, as funny. So clearly, despite, I think, uh, many you know, very little marketing being actively discriminatory and, uh, uh, and, and sexist, there is a lot of uh, implicit bias still being shown in, in advertising, uh, and that's something that, that we need to try to address as, as an industry. So I guess there are a couple of, uh, of, of ways that we can try and address that. I mean, the first is in, in coming together and, and making a conscious, a conscious decision to, um, uh, to, to change that. Um, but it's not just that. It's not just the, um, you know, the advertising industry in which that needs to happen. You know, it's a wider issue as well. So I'll just quickly hand over to, to Rana to talk about that uh, for a second. Okay. Hi. <laughs> I was saying that bias in AI is very real and it's a problem, and we see that manifest in, uh, in many examples around us. Um, so, for instance, uh, Microsoft released this AI chatbot on Twitter, and um, the chatbot was learning from people's tweets, and very quickly, within less than a day, it became very mean and very racist, and they had to pull it down. <clears throat> We've seen other examples where the iPhone X um, Apple had to refund some devices because it couldn't tell Chinese people apart, which basically means that essentially when they were tra uh, training their face detection algorithm, um, they didn't have enough Chinese people to train the algorithm with, with and so it, it, it wasn't sensitive enough to um, Chinese people. Uh, and there's lots and lots of examples um, like that. And the main message here is that if we're not careful in how we are designing these AI algorithms and these AI systems and how we're applying them, we are basically just going to perpetuate all of the biases we see in society that Graham just talked about, and we're just going to implement them in our AI systems, which is not good. Mm -hmm. So, so I guess it's a, a little scary that uh, um, you know we may think of that technology as, as helping us get around our biases, but as Rana says, um, it may actually uh, um, crystallise them even more. So I guess you know there is a there is a question here, and how do we how do we address this? And how do we how do we make a difference? Uh, and bringing it back to the marketing sphere for a minute, I mean there 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 seems to me to be two things that, that are critical. One is I guess being aware of the the potential for these biases. Uh, and, and making an active and conscious choice to, to try and fight against them. So we've increasingly seen some of the major advertisers in the world uh, come together to, to try and take that action and, and change the way that they uh, create advertising, the sorts of advertising that, that they create. So many of you are aware of the, uh, the Young Stereotype Alliance, which was founded a couple of years ago, uh, where you have major advertisers like, such as Unilever, AT&T, Diageo, uh, uh, Procter and Gamble, Vodafone, WPP come together to make a, to, to set some clear goals around the sorts of advertising they want to make, uh, uh, and also put in place uh, some actions to uh, to implement that. And many of those those uh, companies, uh, many of whom are our clients, have, have we you know have certainly changed the the sorts of ads that they make. And we'll, we'll show you some example or, or an example in a in a moment. Um, so you know, making a conscious decision is, is critical here. But I guess the, the second point is also around, um, you know, making a business case for change and making a business case for a more inclusive and diverse portrayal of people um, uh, within the marketing uh, campaigns that, that we create. Um, and that, I guess, is where um, the, sorts of, uh, the sorts of technologies and the sorts of data that we've been working on with, with Affectiva and with clients um, can come in and, and, and can help. Because it's, uh, it's undoubtedly clear that, um, you know, not only are ads that portray people more progressively a more um, uh, an ethically correct thing to do, they're also better ads. Uh, and we've got some very clear da uh, data from the work that we've done uh, using, as I said, some of uh, the effective emotion AI technology that makes that case. So just to, uh, to, to take a step back and remind people of some of the work that, that we do, as Rana said earlier on, um, 
uh, uh, one of the main things that, that we do together is use Affective as Emotion AI technology in the advertising development research we do. So we work with, uh, with the majority of the Fortune 500 in helping them um, uh, monitor or develop uh, their advertising. And one of the tools that we use to, to do that is, is our link advertising uh, or creative development um, process. In that, we uh, take a sample of, uh, of the potential audience, show them the ad, and, and ask them a series of structured questions around it. But the first time we show them the ad, or the first and second time we show them the ad, uh, we also ask them uh, if, they, if they mind being filmed, and if they give us permission, then we film them as they watch the ad, and then we use uh, Affectiva's emotion AI technology to uh, code the facial expressions that uh, they show as they watch the ad. So that gives us a, a clear sense of the emotional response moment by moment uh, as people uh, engage or, or don't engage uh, with what they're, they're seeing. So using that kind of data, we've been able to take a look at you know, what, is, what is the impact of a, a more progressive portrayal of people in advertising uh, and what is the impact of a, a less progressive portrayal or a more regressive uh, portrayal. And in particular, we've done that uh, in conjunction with um, one of our key clients, Unilever. Uh, because on a lot of the Unilever um, work that we've done in the last couple of years, uh, we've not only uh, measured advertising in the way I've described, but we've also um, included questions where we've asked people how the, the main characters were portrayed. So were they portrayed in a progressive way? Were they, did they see them as, uh, as being seen as modern and diverse? Or were they portrayed in a more regressive and stereotypical and, and traditional way? And so by, looking, by separating ads into two groups, we could see how, how ads that are progressive tend to perform versus those that don't. And the results were, were really, really clear. So ad, you can see, and you can see them on the screen. So ads that were, the ads that were most progressive, portrayed people in the most progressive light uh, and diverse light, uh, were on average about 25% more likely to be effective in either the long uh, or the short term uh, on our metric. So there's a clear, a clear benefit to, to progressive advertising. Um, and in particular, that seemed to come from a much uh, stronger emotional response and, and higher degree of engagement with more progressive ads. So they were, uh, they were more engaging and enjoyable, and that was based on what both people's ratings and you know, things they said about the ads, but also based on uh, their facial expressions as they, as they watched the ads. They also said they were more relevant, and they said they were, they, they were more likely to be different to other advertising. And we also saw a lot more surprise responses uh, as people watched the ads. So perhaps it's a, a bit of a shame, actually, that, uh, that people find diverse and progressive ads surprising, but um, they, you know, they, they seem to at the moment, uh, and maybe that'll, that'll change as it becomes more of the norm. But certainly for now, there's a, there's a, a clear benefit to, to progressive advertising, and, and we see that in people's emotions. Conversely, if we look at the least progressive ads, uh, again, uh, using that data set we, we collected with, uh, with Unilever, we see, uh, again, that the, the least progressive ads um, tended to be more likely to do, do badly. So they were twice as likely to get the lowest scores on both long and short term effectiveness. And the reason for that, again, seems to be, again, the, the, the negative response, the barrier that seems to come up as people see ads that, that portray people in a stereotypical fashion. So we saw more disgust expressions, we saw more frowns as people watched those sorts of ads, and that translated uh, into weaker overall uh, responses. So based on that, there seems to be clearly a, a strong penalty to, to portraying people in, in a stereotypical way and a clear business benefit to, to the use of diversity. And we did just want to, to show, a, you know, bring that to life a little and show an example. Um, so we're going to show an example from uh, a different company that's, that's really embraced this more progressive view of advertising, uh, and that's Coca-Cola. This, uh, this is a great spot that uh, kind of risks on their, their advertising heritage, but um, takes a, a rather more progressive and diverse uh, slant on that. So we'll show you the ad, and then I'll show you a quick, uh, quick view of the results uh, that, that we see when we play this to people. Ogni 
so you can see there's a, there's a very different take on the, the classic Diet Coke kind of uh, uh, hunk guy uh, and reaction to him. And, and we see a really powerful emotional response to that, uh, to that kind of more diverse view. So the, the numbers on the left-hand side of the, this slide just show where that ad scores in the distribution of, uh, of ads that, that we've researched. And uh, in, in this particular market, we see enormous scores on uh, expressiveness, so it appears in the 97th percentile of our database, huge scores on smiles, again, 91st percentile, and also uh, some pretty good uh, scores in terms of surprise as well. So this ad is, is clearly engaging people, and it's engaging people in, in a very positive way. Uh, the lines that you can see on the on the slides show, in particular, the way people's smiles, uh, on average, developed uh, over the course of the ad. So the dark line uh, shows people sm show people's smiles the first time they viewed the ad. Uh, the dotted line showed people's smiles on their second viewing. And you can see a really clear and, and, and strong response. The, we see a, 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 a whole burst of smiles as, uh, as uh, the adoring guy is, uh, is shown looking out of the window. We see some great uh, responses as, uh, as the, 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 the two protagonists kind of you know, fight to get there first with holding the bottles of Coke. And then you know, when, uh, when the other lady is revealed having already um, given the, the, the Coke to, to the poor guy, we see, again, a, a, a really strong response. And not only that, that you know, those smiles are, are, are sustained on second view. So this is not just a one-off that, that kind of will fall flat. It's clearly something that sustains engagement uh, with repeated viewing. So this is a great example of, of the sorts of responses that you see you know, to, to well-done progressive advertising. Of course, you know, it, it, as is the case with any narrative, if it's not, not well executed, you know, it, it will still fall flat. But we tend to see some really powerful um, responses, uh, and this is a, a great example of that. Graham, I, I, I know we yep. often look at the different exposure lines um, between the first mm -hmm. and the second viewing, and um, mm -hmm. um, I find it really interesting that the smiles on the second exposure happen, you know, slightly before it happens mm -hmm. on the first time they've seen it, which suggests that they are remembering the ad. Um, do you want to comment uh, on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, there's clearly a sense of anticipation. So it's interesting that the, the earlier scenes are generating a stronger response on view two, as you say, uh, as people are already familiar with the storyline, you know, taking a little bit more out of it. You know, in cases where, where the idea might kind of not have legs or, or, or fall slightly flat, we often see the, the second view being a, you know, a weaker pattern, uh, but that's absolutely not the case here. It's, uh, it, it's a great idea that, that works well and, and, and clearly works well, uh, is likely to work well over time. So as, a, as an example overall, uh, I, mean, I think, I think uh, that's a great case, but also going back to the, the data we showed earlier, there's clearly um, not just a, an ethical case for, for a more diverse portrayal of people and a more progressive portrayal of people uh, in advertising. There's clearly a business imperative uh, here as well, because simply put, um, you know, more progressive ads that are, are more in tune with, with you know, the, the modern world and, and how people want to be, you know, those are, those are ads that will in all likelihood generate a stronger business response. So there's, there's a business case as well as a, as a moral one. So I think the more we can share data like this, the more we can make this kind of case to our stakeholders, the more likely we are to, to see that kind of business behavior stick and, and, and see changes in, in, uh, away from those figures that I showed earlier on. I just wanted to, to end my section with a couple of other observations about perhaps how we might make you know, uh, initiatives like the Unstereotype Alliance really stick. Uh, and, and there were three things that, that I wanted to, to say. One was, was around measurement. Uh, I think there's, it, it's really interesting that the Emotion AI technology that we use with, with, uh, in conjunction with Affectiva at Canton Millwood Brown is, is able to pick up these results. So and I think it's really important that people uh, measure the perceptions of diversity um, in the marketing that they that they make, and and look at the impact that that has. So, you know, this sort of uh, evidence can be really compelling uh, within businesses to to help make the case. Uh, secondly, I think there is a, a point around a diversity of view when it comes to the development of campaigns. Uh, I think many of the the kind of the, the the issues that we've seen in marketing recently have not necessarily come from people deliberately um, you know, seeking to offend or to, or to be biased, but just not seeing interpretations that, that other people might put upon their, their campaigns. So ensuring a diversity of team allows you to spot that um, and, and to, to pick up potential issues that wouldn't otherwise be there. But there's also a wider point, I think, around who we talk to in developing advertising. 
So in a, in a kind of digital marketing world, it's very easy to, to feel that our, our campaigns can be hyper-targeted and only ever uh, seen by a, the, the core target that we had in mind because that's who we're, we're buying and, and, and we're being very specific. When in fact the reality is um, targeting is never as, as good as we think it is. Campaigns will always be seen by a much wider group of people. So it's critical, I think, as we're developing ads to uh, you know, talk to a, wide, a wider range of people than perhaps we think we should, a wider target audience, so that um, we can see potentially alternative interpretations of the creative that, that, that we've put together. And, and that then hopefully avoids cases where, where people you know, see things in, in ads that weren't intended. Uh, but I guess that also links to the third piece, which is to persevere and to be brave, because it, there's always a reason to, to not take a more diverse uh, you know, uh, choice than casting, for instance. You know, there will always be people who, or a minority of people who get offended by more progressive portrayals. So it's interesting that the, in the top 10 ads that were uh, complained about in the UK last year, at least half of them featured uh, what might be considered to be progressive in their portrayal of people with disabilities or gender uh, uh, or sexual orientation. So there will always be some people that, that are offended. But the key is, I think, to stick with it because the data we've got here is clearly shows uh, that the majority of people will, will be with you with a more diverse um, uh, approach to advertising. So, you know, I think there is a, a degree of bravery and, and perseverance required. And, and frankly, really, you know, responsiveness if things go wrong. So, so I think, you know, we, there's, a clear, there's clear uh, evidence here for the power of diversity, um, and that's very clear in the, in the marketing space. I'm going to hand back to Rana now, who can talk a little about um, diversity in the technology sector and, and how that sector is, is seeking to address uh, some of the issues that, that, that it raises. Yeah, thank you, Graham. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, again, you know, we're, we're seeing kind of some of the, the same issues that Graham talked about in the advertising world, in the AI and technology world as well. And we as a company have made a decision to very proactively um, be on the forefront of, uh, you know, um, being transparent about how our technology works and also being very thoughtful about how to avoid bias um, in our algorithms. Um, you know, especially especially that, you know, it's being used to understand people's perceptions to, um, you know, to brands and, 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 and how progressive ads are. So we, we want to make sure that the underlying technology is sound. Um, so we have three pillars, basically, that um, feed into our approach to avoiding bias. The first is data. The second is how we train our algorithms. And the third is team. And I'll just kind of take you behind the scenes uh, on how we train our algorithms. So data is very critical. And we, we talked. Um, we have collected over, um, actually I'll take a, a step back first and kind of walk you through our process for how we train and validate our emotion recognition algorithms. Um, so we use uh, deep neural nets and um, the idea is that we feed these algorithms um, hundreds of thousands of examples of people doing various, diff you know, various facial expressions. And um, the neural net first learns how to find a face and then it localizes the main landmarks on the face. Um, so for instance, finding um, your eyes, your eyebrows, your mouth, and, and that it uses that to triangulate or lock into the location of your face and, and facial features. And then it feeds that entire bounding box into another set of layers of neural nets that map the um, textures and the um, kind of the movements of your of your face into a number of facial expressions and emotional states. Um, um, to date, we are able to recognize over 20 different facial expressions, seven emotional states. We are also able to quantify uh, age, gender, and ethnicity. So the first kind of pillar in how we avoid bias is around data, right? So we have so far analyzed over six and a half million faces in 87 countries around the world, which is about 3.8 billion facial frames. It's a ton of data, and, and it is all spontaneous people emoting either on their device uh, while watching content, uh, or in some cases, even driving or doing other, other things as well. And as you can see from this map, um, a lot of our data is outside of the United States. We do a lot of work in Asia and a lot of work in, in Latin America and other areas around the world. And that is really, really key when it comes to um, training these um, deep learning algorithms. 
so when we think about avoiding bias, um, training is a key component of this process, and it is really critical that when we are training these algorithms, we're very thoughtful and mindful about the sampling strategy we use to pick examples for the algorithm to see. Um, so the data I'm showing you here is um, um, data for our SMILE classifier, and it's broken down, uh, and this is a training data set, right? So these are all the different examples of SMILEs that we're giving this algorithm. And you can see that there is a good balance of gender, but more importantly, perhaps, there's a good va uh, balance of eth ethnic representation in our training example. So we have African Americans and South Asians and Hispanics and Caucasians in our data set. And that is really critical because if the algorithm only sees, you know, male Caucasians and then all of a sudden we're applying this algorithm or this smile classifier in Southeast Asia, it's not going to work. It's not going to work reliably or accurately. So the sampling strategy is really critical. Um, um, by the same token, what we do next is after we train these algorithms, we retest and validate um, the models by slicing and dicing the data to ensure that there are no hidden biases. So in this particular example, again, we're looking at the accuracy of the SMILE classifier. Um, we look at the accuracy for males versus females. It's kind of the same. There's no statistically significant difference here. Um, we are also able to break the validation results by um, ethnicity. And once again, you can see that by and large, it does pretty well on the various ethnic groups. I do find it quite intriguing that it does particularly well uh, on the Latino or Hispanic group, and um, we certainly want to do a deeper dive to understand what's driving that. Um, my theory is that um, we find that Hispanics are very expressive and their expressions tend to be very clear. Um, so it, could, it might just be that they're easier to pick and the algorithm finds that, you, you know, um, it's, it's able to more accurately classify these SMILE um, um, examples. Um, but it's not just ethnicity and gender. We are able to break down the results by all sorts of metrics. Um, I'm showing here an example where we are uh, looking at um, different types of camera sensors. So the RGB is kind of what you would expect on your, uh, on your phone, for instance. Uh, near IR or near infrared, um, allows for night vision, and this is particularly crucial in some other areas where we apply our technology, such as automotive, where we're able to, or we want to be able to understand people's cognitive and emotional states while driving and um, understanding states like fatigue or drowsiness, uh, which often happen during the night. So night vision is really important. Um, so we are continuing to, you know, introspect into our models and, and take a very thoughtful approach in how we train and test these models. And with the thesis that if we do find that there are any particular subcategories where the algorithm isn't doing well, we would resample and kind of include more of that data into our training and hopefully fix the bias problem if we see it. Um, and then the final prong or pillar to all of, of this is diversity in the team itself that is building um, these AI algorithms. and um, we take diversity and inclusion um, to heart at Affectiva. We're a very diverse team. Uh, we hail from all over the world. Uh, we have offices in the U.S. as well as offices in Cairo, Egypt. Um, and I think that that is really, really important because as you're designing these different AI algorithms and also thinking about how it's being applied in the real world, you want people to say, hey, you know, we don't have enough examples of women wearing a hijab in our data set. We really ought to. Um, and so bringing these different perspectives is really important as we, um, as we design these AI algorithms. Um, so as I said, our technology power, powers several industries. Uh, market research and advertising research is definitely one of our big um, uh, products and, and use cases, but we are also partnering with companies in the automotive industry and social robotics and, and other areas. And I wanted to kind of shed light into one area that's very, very interesting and, and using emotion AI in very interesting ways to um, avoid bias, and it's around interviewing and hiring. Uh, one of um, our partners is a company called HireView. Their mission is to humanize the interview process. And so instead of 
um, and they work with um, over 200 of the global 500, Fortune global, global Fortune 500 companies around the world, and they are actually deployed in over 200 countries um, and, and regions all over the world. So, um, what they do is instead of asking people to send in their Word resumes, Word document resumes, they ask people to record short video clips, um, kind of bringing their story to life, talking about their life experiences, um, you know, what's worked for them, what hasn't, examples of challenging experiences that they've had to go through. And using our technology along with natural language processing, they're able to quantify kind of the nonverbal communication of these uh, candidates. And then they have, they follow these candidates through to through the hiring process, and so they have kind of KPIs or um, outcome data like, you know, did they get hired or not, what's the turnover, et cetera. And they build these predictive models, so now they're able to tie your nonverbal behavior during an interview to how well um, you would do on a job if hired. And um, they've been using this process to both kind of help companies find talent faster, but more importantly, hire more diverse uh, talent. And one case study is Unilever, who's been using this um, um, over the last year to sift through hundreds of thousands of applicants, um, to, you know, to hire around the world. And what, you know, our kind of partnership with HireVue has resulted in a 16% increase in diversity hires, both in terms of gender and ethnicity as well as a 90% reduction in time to hire. And what's really important here is basically the algorithm is the first screener. And the algorithm is both gender blind and racial blind. So it's just looking at your nonverbal communication, uh, whereas of course humans, um, as much as we try to, right, uh, we're not necessarily um, always um, blind to these, uh, to these parameters when we're doing interviews. So that's kind of a very successful example of how Emotion AI is once again being used to promote diversity and inclusion, and uh, um, and it's 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 not it's not just kind of the right thing to do. It is really helping these companies advance their um, their mission. Um, so it's not just Affectiva that's prioritizing um, ethics. And, and kind of the, the threat around bias and diversity. Um, this is an industry trend in, in the AI space. Uh, we are part of a consortium called the Partnership on AI to Benefit People and Society. It was started by Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, IBM, and Microsoft a number of years ago. And since then, they have invited um, um, other companies and startups to join. What I find really fascinating about this consortium is that it is a very diverse, um, a group of stakeholders that often do not talk to each other. So you've got the large organizations, you've got small startups like Affectiva, as well as human rights organizations like Amnesty International and ACLU all coming together um, to kind of really think through how can we apply AI in ways that benefit society. Um, Affectiva is part of a uh, specific uh, committee within the Partnership on AI. It's uh, called FATE, and it's talks about fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics in AI. And we, um, our committee is about building these guidelines um, and case studies where AI has been applied successfully in ways that are, you know, transparent and ethical. Um, so um, look for more to come out of this consortium, but it's, it's very exciting to see the industry um, head in that direction. Thanks, Rana. So I guess um, just one final slide for, from us to, to sum up before we uh, before we hand over for questions. I mean, I think if, if I was going to try and summarise what we what we've been saying today, it, it, it's this. You know, it is that um, bias is all around us. It's it's kind of part of, of who we are, and, and you know, in many ways, we can't help it because you know it's it's an implicit thing that that we're not always aware of. But you know, it clearly, um, you know, people are looking for a more uh, diverse and fairer world. They're looking for a more diverse and fairer portrayal of people in in, in marketing and business around them. Uh, and in many ways, you know, we in business have got to run to to catch up with with people's expectations. But you know, with the right technologies, with the right uh, research tools, and and with the right will, um, you know, we can do that. We can take stock of where we are, uh, encourage 
uh, greater diversity in hires, in marketing, in campaigns, and, and in our business, uh, and we can uh, reap the, the, the rewards in, in all senses of the word that that, that brings. So I guess that's everything that, that we had to say. Um, I'll hand over back to Ashley, who I think can moderate some questions uh, if we have a little time. Hi, yes. yes. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, Graham and Rana. Thank you so much. It was a fantastic presentation. We are getting quite a few questions in for you, so I'll field a few that we have time for. And reminder, if you have a question, please use the Q&A chat box on the bottom right of your screen, and we will answer them if we have time. So the first question, actually we had a few of the, related to this topic, but this is for Graham. Um, how was it determined that an ad was more or less progressive, and how is progressiveness measured? Sure, no, no, that's, a, that's a fair question. So in this particular um, case, what we've, what we've done is we've added a series of questions to the research that we do. When, when, we, when we show people ads, we, you know, we ask them a, a variety of things about it. One of those batteries of questions was around um, you know, the, the perceptions of the main characters in the ad. So were they shown in ways that were showing them in, in traditional roles? Were they shown in ways that were showing them in, in more progressive and, uh, and modern roles? So it was very much um, you know, not, not determined by us as researchers, but it was determined by uh, the audience that we showed the ads to and, and, and their perceptions of, of, uh, of the people. Okay, and we just had one come in that we'll take to Rana. Um, healthcare and drug efficacy were mentioned as industries where you've used Emotion AI. Do you have any examples of how Emotion AI was used in these industries? And um, um, which which industries, Ashley? You broke up a little bit. Health, for me. health, healthcare. Oh. Healthcare and drug efficacy. Yes. So in healthcare, uh, we are. Um, so the idea of emo applying emotion AI in healthcare is more around this concept that we want to quantify mental health. Um, you know, when when you walk into a doctor's office, you are not asked what your blood pressure or temperature is. We just measure it. Um, however, in the world of mental health, um, the gold standard is still asking people, um, you know, on a scale from one to ten, how depressed are you, or how much pain are you in, or how suicidal are you? And it's, it, we know that it is very unreliable data. Um, so we are partnered with um, a number of researchers that are looking at facial and vocal biomarkers of mental health. We're also partnered with a company that is taking our technology and incorporating it into uh, Google Glass um, to help individuals on the autism spectrum. Um, I particularly like that example because we know um, that individuals on the autism spectrum have a very hard time finding jobs. In fact, they have a very hard time even going through the interview process because they're disadvantaged by definition because they don't have all the social and nonverbal uh, cues that, that, that you would expect kind of gives you a leg up during the interview process. So um, BrainPower, which is our partner company who's focused on, on solving this problem, they are building social training tools um, to help these individuals um, kind of do better during that process, but also at the same time educate the rest of us uh, on how to, how, to, how to be thoughtful uh, when we are um, dealing with individuals on the, on the spectrum. Lots to do there, actually. There's a lot of potential for good in this space. Great. Okay, so another one that just came in back to Graham. So in terms of perseverance in, you know, representing diversity, how do we determine when to push through or when we have overstepped and need to pull back? <laughs> that's a good, again, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Uh, I mean, I think you'll, you'll, see, you'll see it within the responses that you get in, in the creative development process if, if you're doing the right kind of research. Um, and I, I guess I'm about to say that so I'm representing a research company, but I think that's genuinely true in that um, you know you, the, there can be good progressive advertising and bad progressive advertising, um, and and it's the audience reaction that will tell you whether whether that's happening or not. Um, so there you know there there may be times where you overstep the mark and you'll see it in, in research if you haven't done the research you're kind of if you just put it out there and decide to to react on the fly. Um, you know, it's very hard to, to then kind of claw back to any of the, the problems that that may cause. So again, I, to, to go back to my point earlier, I, I think it is really important to, you know, take a, take a diverse view in terms of your audience during creative development. But if you do that, you should both, um, you know, I think, give yourself the faith 
to, to progress something that is that is a little different um, when you when you've got it right. But also you'll spot cases where you know there's an interpretation placed on an ad that you just hadn't thought of, um, and and actually be able to avoid some of the the, the kind of landmines that that creates. Great. Okay. So back to Rana. Uh, interesting question. Will Emotion AI work with crowds rather than with one individual in the camera frame? Yes, it uh, it already does actually. So we have uh, versions of our SDK that are able to uh, detect multiple faces in an image. It will obviously depend on the type of camera you're using and how uh, wide is the field of view of that camera sensor. Um, but yes, we are able to um, to capture crowds, which which actually opens up a lot of questions around data privacy and consent. Um, but the technology can do it. Okay. Um, another question for Graham. Um, are the statistics about women in advertising consistent across geographies or are some countries more progressive than others? And I think this is in reference to the stat on the fifth slide around 4% yep. of women in aspirational roles. Yeah, That's I mean, great. I don't have, yeah, it's a great question. I don't, unfortunately, I don't have the, the breakdown uh, to hand. I think clearly things are, um, uh, Things are very much variable by by market, though there's no no question. And I think an important point is what is what is progressive in one market may not be progressive uh, in another one. So I think in developing uh, you know a, a progressive campaign, you have to be very sensitive to to local nuance, um, uh, unsurprisingly. Uh, and and it won't be the case that one one creative will fit all. Um, you know, there and and that that's always been true, but it's it's, it's particularly true here. So something that may seem pretty tame in um, in uh, in one market may may not be at all in uh, in another. Um, so again, it, it becomes a question of you know understanding which markets may have a different view of uh, of what counts as progressive, um, and both creating the right um, uh, uh, spots and, and ideas for those markets, but also making sure that you you do the work to to test out you know whether it, that's actually working or not. Sure. Okay, and back to Rana, and I'm not sure if you touched on this, Rana, if this is like an external question, but what are some of the use cases with emotion sensing from speech? Ooh, from speech, yeah. Um, so the way I like to think about this is that there are um, like a Venn diagram. So there are some applications that work very well for, for face only, some applications that work very well for voice only, and then there's a, a, a class of the universe where both intersect and, and this multimodal approach of sensing human cognitive states and emotional states um, becomes a lot more accurate when you have the two channels available. Um, so one example where they both overlap is in the world of automotive, for instance, where we're doing a lot of work uh, understanding um, the, um, the state of mind of the drivers and the occupants in a vehicle. Um, and you could imagine things like, um, you know, understanding if people are tired or drowsy or intoxicated, which again manifests both on the face and the voice. Um, social robotics is another area where, where you can imagine both channels being very, very helpful and actually critical um, as, the, as the social robot needs to understand the, the cues and the nonverbal communication of the people it's interacting with. It needs to have both channels available. Um, if we think about areas where it's voice only, um, call centers is, is a huge market for voice analytics, um, both after the fact analytics, but also in the moment, just in time routing of calls based on the level of anger or frustration of, um, of, of callers. Um, we've all been in, in these situations. And then conversational interfaces, so you, you know how you interact with a Siri or an Amazon Alexa or a Google Home. If imagine if these interfaces are have you know emotion, voice-driven emotion AI, and can understand again level of frustration or, or, or engagement, and use that to build rapport and trust. Great. And then one more question for you, Rana. I just came in quickly. Uh, you mentioned automotive. What is the affectiva play there, especially with regard to diversity? Um, so with, with, I mean, the general play is we are um, developing an in-cabin sensing AI solution that understands 
um, again, we, you know, it's, it's broader than just your emotional states. It's more about your cognitive, social, and emotional states. It's really your state of mind within the vehicle, whether you are a driver in the cars of today or you're an occupant in kind of, you know, the world of self-driving vehicles and robo-taxis. Um, and the play there is to improve safety, but also personalize um, the experience. And I, I find it very intriguing because the automotive world is very quickly kind of um, converging with the world of advertising and media because it is really all about personalizing the message and the content based on your profile. So we're doing a lot of work there. Um, in terms of diversity, it's really about the diversity of the data set. So we're collecting data, um, driving data not just in the U.S., but um, we have a large data collection initiative in, in Africa as well as in Asia, and that's really critical. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess, Ron, the, the, you've got some of the same principles at play there um, mm -hmm. that you talked about earlier in that, you know, you, you need your algorithms to, you need that diverse data set because you need your algorithms to be to be blind to, to ethnicity and, and gender and things like that so that the, the the kind of occupant detection is as strong um, in, in, from one person to the next, and it's the same same in some ways for us when we're um, using the technology for advertising. You know, we we're greatly reassured by the some of the stuff that you you showed earlier that because we know we can pick up the the same emotional response in uh, in Asia, in Africa, as well as kind of you know Europe and uh, Latin America. We 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 know that we're we're not influenced by um, any inherent biases in, in that, so we can be, be confident in the, in the emotional response we're detecting. Exactly. Excellent. Okay, well, that's just about all we have time for for this event. I want to thank you, Graham and Rana, for your time today, and for all of you for joining us and for your questions. We tried to answer as many as we could, uh, but it was an amazing webcast. I certainly learned a lot from. I hope you did, too. Uh, we did record today's presentation, so you should receive an email shortly with the recording. For details on our next webcast and other upcoming events, please follow us on social media and keep checking our events page and sign up for our monthly newsletter at affectiva.com. So thanks again and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.